Okay, well, perhaps we should make a start. Time is wearing on. Uh, so, it's my pleasure, this being my very first ever SPAB Skillshare, to introduce Jane Hill, who's going to speak to us about the Battle of the Bulge um, and uh, Shepherd's Cottage. Uh, as some of you may know, Jane is a writer, author, and curator hafted to Highgate, um, who will be talking to us about her cottage. Uh, so, Jane, please feel free to take it away. Hello, thank you, Michael. Yes, well, we I started with this map of Highgate, so while you were waiting, you could orientate yourself a, a little. And my talk is, it, it's about a love affair with a house, really. And, and also, it's a bit of a roller coaster because it was a, a rather terrible thing that happened, but ended up being resolved in the most, in the best possible, possible way. But if you look at uh, the, the map here, you can see, well, the red, the red square, that's the first thing to point out. The red square is the cottage, this 17th century cottage known as the Shepherd's Cottage. It might be more accurate actually to call it a drover's cottage or a grazier's cottage. And you will also see the high street was built in front of it. So the high street is later than the cottage, but I'm going to show half of my talk will be slides actually orientating you and showing Highgate and, and the, the position of the cot cottage within, within the village. And Highgate is still very, very much a, a village. So if we go, let me see. I know it keeps asking me to, my apologies. The, the moving function isn't always working. Let me see what's happening. all slides it's not what I wanted but right, I hope that now will work so this is the article that I wrote back in 2017 when I had major conservation work and un, un, uh, undertaken on on the east facing gable wall of, of this cottage and what what do you do when that should be really a 350 year old wall wants to part company with the rest of your house it was, and I'm also giving this Skillshare today because I am so immensely grateful to, to SPAB and the ways in which they helped me when I was faced with the most horrendous uh, problem. And starting with, well, David John, the conservation architect who's on the technical advice line, and then other people I will mention, Ed Morton of the Morton Partnership, structural engineer, who then put me in touch with Conamian of Triscoll Conservation. Connor described the, the, the problem, our dilemma, as being the growing pains of structural puberty. And you'll understand what that means when, when we get going. So this is the Ordnance Survey map from 1863. The first Ordnance Survey was 1801. And the reason I've chosen this one is because it really, I mean, apart from going back, returning to the 1746 rock map, you can see Highgate before, well, when it was still referred to as being near London, as opposed to being of London, and it was really Highgate before a, a lot of, well, the 1930s developments of Chumley Lodge and, uh, and Chumley Crescent. So you'll see that it's full of yards. There are seven yards, each name. So White Lion Yard, Kent's Yard, Townsend Yard, Broadbent Yard, Duke's Head Yard, and that's all on the on the Haringey side and on the Camden side is Bullens Yard and Angel's Yard. And behind that, the open area, which you can see as, as fields with, with the trees in, that is the Highgate Bowl. And that is where the drovers, when they brought the animals down the Old North Road en route to Smithfield, this was the first port of call into, well, out, outer London uh, as it then was. And this is where the animals were fed and watered and rested and where you had lairage. And so it was full of public houses, inns and, and butchers. And you'll also see there was a medieval, I mean, actually I've chosen this also because here, this is Bisham House and this is before Bisham House was demolished in the 1880s and Bisham Gardens now, now sits, but it was full of 
great houses and also very humble dwellings in, in the backlands. These are the backlands of, of Highgate on this side behind, behind the cottage. This photograph of the cottage was taken, you can see it here, you know, it, it behind, behind the high street. This was taken by John Gay, who, and there, I think, I think there's something like 40, no, maybe, anyway, uh, the, the John Gay historic collection of photographs dating from 1945 to 1990 is now looked after by Historic England. And this is one, he, he produced a book with John Betjeman in 1967 called Prospect of Hampstead and Highgate. And he took many photographs of Highgate and he also produced a book on Highgate Cemetery. So many of Highgate Cemetery as well, but the book is 1967. So I suspect this photograph is from round about that time. And up until last year, this is pretty much, this was absolutely the scene that you would still have seen. These low-lying single-story buildings here are in the curtilage of the cottage, were pre-motor age. So they were probably cart shed, something like that. This drawing is by Carl Simon, and this is 2010. So as I said, you know, it's a, it was very much, very much the same up until very recently. And the reason I put this on is, is to actually demonstrate that the, it's hard to, very hard to date the cottage. It's in some books, it's said to be probably to date from the 1660s. In another book, it's called 18th century, early 18th century. But you'll see from the Gambrel, this uh, Gambrel roof, which is a, a mansard roof where the lower part is steeper than the than the upper part and that is a suggestion that it might be might be earlier we think this photograph here was taken in the in the 1980s and i put it up because this is a rather astonishing cutting it comes from the highgate literary and scientific scientific institution archives and this was a a visionary planner. So in 1980, Gavin Clark, who was a visionary planner, he was saving, salvaging materials from old buildings if they were demolished or if they were being altered on, and changed. And he stored these old, these old pantals and bricks in Ali Pali in Alexandra Palace so that other people wanting to restore their old buildings using authentic materials and contemporary materials could access that, that collection. This is the entrance to Townsend Yard. So late 19th century, that was the entrance. You can see it's a single width, single lane, of uh, course and hub cart coming out here. By 1935, it was it has changed slightly. The building on the corner you can see has been, has been changed. And this photograph was actually donated by the borough engineer in 1971. These rather astonishing and beautiful 17th century wood cottages that I think people, we, we, we would long to have these now, but at the time they were considered to be a slum. And you'll see there the man holding the stick to show how out of kilter the buildings are is Mr. Kerry, the builder, who had who had his workshops on, on Townsend Yard. I like this because you see, actually, we can't see any geraniums, but those pots, maybe they would have had geraniums in them. And is, is that a, a canary cage up, up here? But also these lying on their lying flat are actually very long, narrow ladders. There, there's there's the ladder. So this photograph was taken around about 1904 for the medical officer of health. So people were already beginning to worry, feel concerned about the conditions of, of life and living in these 17th century cottages. Rare survivors, I, I would have thought. This painting is called A Bit of Old Highgate. It's from a book called The Skirts of the Great City. And it actually demonstrates how well, the topography of Highgate that's so unique and the Northern Heights Ridge and what is known as the Highgate Bowl behind where the land just, it just goes literally into a bowl shape. And you can see these extended uninterrupted views out to the north 
from there. But Highgate is literally pretty well built on sand. And that prevented uh, sprawl, I think, uh, prevented, which is why uh, Mr. Chester, who was one of the, the founders of the institution in 1839, could actually address his letters saying near London. This was Jack Foster, the water seller's cottage, thatched cottage, as you can see, which is rather unexpected. I found that rather unexpected for, for Middlesex or in what has become London, obviously. And he would sell water to the neighbours. The, the, the land, the Highgate Boyle, is full of springs and full of wells. And he would sell a pail pay, pay, full of water for halfpence, a halfpence. There are... 36 views of Highgate after drawings and photographs by William West, who, and these are all in the collection of the of the British Museum, can be seen there. This is now Highgate Bowl by the 1950s, when I'll go back to the drovers and, and the story of the drovers, but by the 1950s, when there was droving wasn't taking place in, in, in the same way, this was nursery land. And so plants were being grown and also flowers later on for, for the Highgate Cemetery. After being nursery land, it became a garden centre in 1986 and the Friends of the Highgate Bowl were formed in 2014 when there was concern about whether or not when the garden centre closed, whether, well, to prevent this from being developed. Jack Foster's cottage was later lived in by Sammy Andrews. And Sammy, this is called, this is another newspaper cutting. It's called a Cinderella export plan. Sammy turns a pumpkin into dollars. And what he was doing was carving biblical texts and children's names on pumpkins. And he had the, his, one of his adages was, I don't hold with gaiety. You can learn everything you want from nature. This is uh, the bottom of, of Townsend Yard, just before you come into, into what was the garden centre, where it's the beginning of the Highgate Bowl, and where you actually come across this, what is really like a natural auditorium in, in shape. This also actually is, is the threat, the threat of development to open space, uh, particularly urban open space. And this, this cartoon appeared in the ham and high, I can't see the watch for the trees. And actually you will see that, oh, sorry. These, um, this, is, this is the cottage and these are the lime trees alongside my boundary wall with, with, with my neighbor. So this is 90, a scene from 1924 where sheep are still being driven uh, up the North Road, up to the village. Cattle were actually brought to Smithfield Market for slaughter on the hoof until 1939, although by the 1830s steamships were doing more of the travelling of, of cattle, and then by the 1850s the, the railways were, were taking the animals. So as I mentioned, so Highgate was full of butchers and, and inns, and this was, and there are two existing canopies over the, over the high street. This was Randall's The Butchers, and it was the butcher's house and behind were the piggeries and, and also, I assume, an abattoir as well. And here is the old smithy, which is always amazes me because it's like, like bronze casting. Uh, smiths and forges were pretty low tech, but the fact they would be in a wooden building rather amazes me as well. They would also uh, be shoeing the horses. This really charming watercolour oh, shows, this is dates from, let me see, from 1894. And you'll see a second canopy. This is the lower, this is the second of the two canopies on Highgate High Street. And this is the Angel, that was the Angel Inn when it was uh, sort of rusticated. Here is the, the Cooper's Arms and the Angel Inn. So this is on, on the high street, lovely wrought iron uh, arm there for, for holding what would have been the inn sign. This was, this is the, the pewter tankard 
that belong to James Townshend, sometimes spelt Townsend, sometimes spelt, well, now spelt Townsend, but then spelt Townshend. So it, that obviously the Cooper's Arms was his, was his hangout. I put this in because it's, these are cattle layers, but it's hybrid, but it could as well be the Highgate Bowl. And, and you can see the proximity again to, to the backs of houses, which I, which is so interesting, how, how intermingle what the, the concourse of, of people and cattle must have been. This is a drover actually from 1808, or it's from a book that was of 1808, but it shows you how he, they had to wear, they had to be licensed and they wore armorial armbands from the city of London and each one had, had a number. This here now is, is the section of the high street where behind which the cottage is. So the cottage is approached by down this narrow passageway I'm trying to get my cursor there, but you see the lamppost. Just to the right of the lamppost, there's a long Georgian covered narrow passageway. It's the only one of its type in, in Highgate Village. And that, and at the end is a door in a wall, and that that is the cottage. Miss Constant, you see the two shops on, on the front here. Miss Constant was was a milliner and and sold gowns as well, and she owned at one point, she owned both the shops on the high street and the cottage behind. This is a drone photograph uh, taken for, for a short film that was made by the Highgate Neighbourhood Forum last year. And again, it shows you the, the context of the cottage within, within the backlands. This uh, is not, not the most uh, flattering photograph of, of the passageway, but I put it in because at the moment it's being also being used for old legend brace doors and random width planks. And whenever I see old timber in, in skips, I, I, bring it, I bring it home because that's what you want to be repairing an old building with. And these, just up the road, there was an antiquarian bookshop and it was set up, established in the, just after the Second World War, when timber was scarce. And you can see that the bookshelves were made out of old banana crates. And when it changed, early 2000, something like that, when it changed into, became, the, became a vet, of course, all the bookshelves were, were pulled out and I brought them home and have wrapped around one of my rooms in, in the cottage with, with bookshelves. This was quite, a notorious became quite notorious. This is Johnny Spur, who ran it, uh, who lived there and worked there until he was well into his 90s. And the notoriety is that there's a book, it's called Provenance, how a con man and a forger rewrote the history of modern art. And it was about the villain John Dew and the artist John Myatt, who, who forged, uh, well, Graham Sutherland's, Francis Bacon's, all, all sorts. And it's believed that, but using paper from old books like 16th century or whatever century was was needed they they rip out pages out of books at, at Fisher and Spur to get the old paper with the watermarks so actually the cottage here you can't see the front door but I put this in because the door to the cottage at the end of the passageway it's never had a letterbox cut into it and it was occupied by Miss Constance and her family for, for the most part of the 20th century. And you can see that when the front door is open, it's the room is the cottage is one room deep over four floors. So you you open the front door and you see through into the through the back door. This now is, uh, I'm going to show you two perspectives of, of, of the inside of the cottage. This is the, the ground floor. And actually here, here this is Connor, Connor Meehan of Triscoll Conservation who did the work that I'm about to show you. This is the, the other perspective where you can see the very steep stairs rising up on, on the left. And actually back before, a huge, huge hearth, huge opening. There are fireplaces on, there would have been fireplaces at each end of, of the cottage on each floor at one time. 
So there are lots of lovely small details that appeal to me. So lead patches on splintered floorboards, uh, old wallpaper that was backed with Hessian. And then behind that was uh, the weekly dispatch, a, a copy from 1828. Here again is showing you the, the steep staircase and there's a better, there'll be a better uh, view later, but if you see the rope hanging down the staircase, clearly people used to hoik themselves up the stairs using the rope that goes through brass, brass rings. I also, this is the first time I actually saw something like this, certainly in London, was uh, Ellen Afarjan's cottage. She had a muse, a muse house in, in Hampstead and she had this same, this same apparatus. This here is the is the first floor, and you can see how again the the, the steepness of of the stairs. And my my theory is that originally this could have been a wooden house that was later wrapped around in brick, and that originally the access between the floors would have been by by ladders, as you as you saw on the top of those wooden houses in Townsend Yard. Another small. Uh, detail on on this first floor this is this floor is the only one that is um partitioned into two rooms and all of the ceilings throughout the cottage are are these uh, wooden wooden boarded ceilings there i put that in because it's a, a light well on the top floor to get light into the onto the stairs it, it's quite a dark cottage because it's only it's all rear facing and it's all north facing so light, getting light in is very important. So these are mismatched window, window stays and monkey tail fasteners. The cottage is featured in, in a, a couple of magazines recently, and this one was for the Bible of British Taste in which can be accessed online. That was last December. But this here you'll see, this is the, the basement and it's it has, a single plank ceiling, which is also the floor above. So light filters through and also warmth and heat filters through. And what some of this might be a, a, is local law, really. It's what, I, what I've been told, but there used to be pipes in the corners of, of this lower ground floor that ran up throughout the house. And, and the suggestion was that the it took the heat from the warmth from the animals, from the sheep that were kept in this byre and warmed the rest of the house in that way. And here you can see in, in the ceiling, which is also the floor above, you can see the hatch. So originally there would have been a ladder down from the floor above down through, through the hatch. So, Pretty well, the only change that was made to the cottage in, in the 1970s was putting this staircase in, this ladder, ladder staircase. And also when, when we moved here in 19, two, sorry, 2001, there was an avocado suite, bathroom suite. But apart from that, nothing else had, had changed. And just to the right there, where you see the opening with the plate rack, that, that's a tiny scullery or back kitchen. This was a coal slope into, into, the, into the basement. Theories Row is the stretch of the high street in, in front where I showed you Miss Constance uh, shops. And this stretch, it was, it was built in 1794. So it was built in front of the high street, uh, built in front of the cottage in 1794. This is the a small cottage in Broadbent Yard, which is the next yard down from Townsend Yard. It was a, a, a typical of the sort of small incremental building that took place in Highgate, in, in the yards. And here, clearly a ladder maker in Broadbent, Broadbent Yard. And again, you can see the backs, that's the backs of, uh, of Theory's Row. This is also can only be seen from Broadbent Yard and this structure, it doesn't belong to the cottage, but it's, it's at the very end of the garden to the cottage. And it's thought to have been made by Townsend who built his own house on the corner of Townsend Yard. So Townsend was a very old family. They, they go back well into the 17th century. But this Townsend was a builder 
and a salvager and and he he demolished Ashurst house which was a major a major enormous house in Highgate where St Michael's church now now sits but it's thought that he actually designed this uh, using sort of disparate materials from Ashurst house and also some medieval elements He also took the door from Ashurst House, and when he built his own house on the corner of Town Zenyar, which is number 42, he, he used that door for his house. So it looks rather incongruous, but it also has the coat of arms for Ashurst House. Now we're coming, now we're coming to the, the, the Skillshare side of things. This is Ivy House. It's part of, uh, it's joined with Northgate House, two wonderful, amazing 17th century, beautiful houses. And you'll see by the, from the, the top story, how different the bricks and the brickwork is to, to the lower stories. And I was told it was before my time, but that there was, this house, what happened to my cottage, also happened to this, this house where there was a major fall of bricks from the top floor. The, the wall just gave out and, and to the point where they couldn't save it and presumably were quite taken by surprise. But it, it also demonstrates that this was a different era really because this now is more of a restoration than conservation and, and the bricks I believe are, are new bricks rather than sourcing old bricks. Or, or reusing the bricks that were that were already there. So this is the horror. This is this um, giant, horrendous bulge in, in the cottage in the east-facing gable wall. We always knew there was a bulge there, and uh, you, you'll see later. I but there's another photograph which we knew there was a bulge. And we had been told that it had been tied in and it had been tied in from the inside working out and that the, the, the council did not want it to be rebuilt at the time. So it was tied in. But what happened was there was this horribly urgent knock at my front door and a neighbour came and said this crack has appeared in this in this great bulge and it looks like it's about to come down. So. That was the the wall wanting to go east and and the the chimney stack wanting to go west. The chimney stack was also at the at the really scary scary angle. Here you can see the first thing was well the first thing was that I rang Spab in absolute desperate I was desperation absolute desperation, and spoke to the, to the wonderfully compassionate and patient and uh, calm. David John, who I mentioned earlier, and then Ed Morton of the Morton Partnership, who's a structural engineer, who when we first moved into the cottage, we, we had met, he fortunately was able to come over really, really quickly. And, and he put me in touch with, with Triscoll Conservation Builders. And the first thing that, the first essential thing was to get the scaffolding up instantly, I mean, as quickly as possible and to shore up this, this massive, massive bulge so that it didn't burst and to stabilize it. It's a very tight space. You, you can see from, from the photographs you've seen of the backs and the yards so far, there are interlinking passages, but the cottage is pretty landlocked. It's, it's wrapped around by, by buildings. So access wasn't easy, it was, it was very tight. And this scaffolding has been raised on my neighbor's flat roof. It's actually rather fortunate they had a flat roof. So that, that was next door. The second thing that had to happen was, uh, well, assessment and documentation of every aspect of, of that wall, the whole of the wall and, and the chimney stack. And you can see by looking at this, what a, what a state the, the chimney stack was in as well. But the documentation was incredibly thorough. There are hundreds and hundreds of photographs and also drawings, drawings of, of, of the wall. And here, th these are two of the pots that, that came, well, there are three pots, three pots in the stack. 
uh, two of these 32 inch ones on, on the right hand side and the other one is a long tom and frottage was taken of, of the, the roulettes, it's called rouletting, the rouletting and the pattern patterning on, on the chimney pot. So every, absolutely everything was documented thoroughly. And if anybody can tell me, well, there's no, there's no, what date that crown might be or what date this pot might be on the right, I'd be, I'd be really grateful because normally with crowns, they're, they're commemorative, obviously, and they'll say which, which king or queen was, was on the throne at the time. So they would normally have, uh, what would it be, RW for William or something like that, but this, this one doesn't. So when one of those pots came down, clearly there'd been a fire at some point, a, a chimney fire because of the, the blackening. And the, this one, the second one, the one on the left, it was uh, the material, it was too badly damaged to go back. So I had to commission a new pot, which was a really thrill thrilling thing to do. Here is a picture from, from the top floor, looking up, looking up, well, as you could, actually not looking up, just put, actually putting a mobile phone inside and letting the phone take, take the image and then seeing what the phone had seen. And you can see here how the, the width, I don't know if you pronounce it width or the withy, but the, the withy walls had party company with, with the outer wall. And this is why the bulge was happening. There was nothing holding it in. So that would have been that, that would have happened because of just the 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 eons of, of sulfurous fires that had done that damage. And when I said earlier that I had a clue, we knew that the that the wall had been tied in. When when we arrived, this is how the that wall, the plaster had been taken off. And and down below you can see the original lime mortar, and up above you can see the, the 20th century repair with, with cement quite quite different. So there was quite a, a fair bit of agonizing, I would say, about whether the chimney stack had to come down, whether the repair could be made to the bulge without actually taking the stack down. And the decision was made that the stack had to come down. And so it was very, very carefully dismantled by, by hand. Another one, this is kind of irresistible because it's so grim. It was, it was so scary at the time. You can see the, the state, the state of that. And again, how friable some of the materials were. Some of the we had actually relatively few losses, not too many losses, but clearly some things uh, could not be replaced. An enormous amount of, of cement, uh, cement repairs, uh, the, uh, the accretion of of years, all of which were very carefully removed. The person we're now going to see most of, and th this is Paul Slack, who is a, a master bricklayer. He's many, many things, a man of many talents, but he was the bricklayer on, on this job. And so having taken down the, the bulge and then raked out, raked out the rest of the wall in order to, to repoint with, with lime mortar, it revealed what had not been these cracks, which had not previously been visible. So there was a, a great deal going on. You can see here again. And so the repairs, these were, these are called, oh, I should have said actually earlier, but you can see from this one as well, how there is no obvious brick bond to, the, to this wall. And it's all really very random. These are heli bars or heli bars, and they're used for, for crack stitching. When the joints were raked out, lots of things uh, emerged, including, of course, clay pipe stems. Now, never found a bowl, which is always a bit, which is uh, I'm rather sorry about. But so clay stem pipes and and rose headed nails, that kind of thing. And the clay stem pipes were returned to the wall when it was re repointed. This here was uh, testing out. You can see the first test of the of the lime mortar that had been mixed because to to get the color right and to make sure it was uh, 
complicit, complicit with what, what was there already. There were several tests, and I, I love this photograph just because I love the tapestry of colours of, of the bricks. It looks like a red house, a red brick house from a distance, but of course there are yellow and black, blackened bricks in there as well, and dun colour. So this here, there's Connor again at, at the end. And this, I think, this is the first stage of pointing. And I think what it's called is, is packing. I think they're packing. So just getting as much mortar in as possible. And, and then for Paul Slack, who is the, the, the bricklayer, he would come along and do the finishing and be the, the perfectionist. But this is just getting the mortar in. Here you can see the inner leaf masonry and again my goodness look how look how random look how random it is so at the end of the day uh paul there was a lot of water involved to keep to keep the uh, presumably to keep the mortar pliable and workable and at the end of the day the wall or the section that had just been pointed would be hung with hessian which would be wet And as, as the wall is going up again, Paul was pargeting the inside of the, of the flues to the chimney as well. And that this mesh is, I don't know what this is called, but clearly it's another way of reinforcing what looks rather shambolic in, inside. More pargeting. Now, Paul, as I said, Paul is a, a man who wears many hats. He's, he's also an actor and he's also a yoga teacher, has become a yoga teacher. And this is Paul in, in locus position. And I saw Paul adopt a whole lot of uh, unnatural poses. And I witnessed a whole section of a uh, succession of them. But... <laughs> This is this is one reason why knowing how to do the locus or take, adopt the locus position was a is a useful thing. So you see now we reach we've reached the top. We're reaching the top. There's another long tom pot on the other end of the of the cottage. So this is our Triscoll, the 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 team up at the very top in well that like the the crow's nest really and with i i often went up and and the views as you can imagine are absolutely astounding so you can see east to the city and st paul's and of course highgate would have been the place where the great fire of london was watched but people would have seen it from from highgate and then out out towards the north as well so this is uh, the pots being reinstated and the newly commissioned pot, which I'll say more about later, is, is on the right hand side. I absolutely adore the attention to detail and again, the colours, the colours of the bricks and the it's a thing of beauty to me. The, the aggregate the, the in getting the right level of ag aggregate in the mortar was very important and painstakingly attended to as well. So this is the. The mixing station because lime mortar was made fresh on on site and this is the there's there's alchemy to making lime mortar it's 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 a rather it's an astonishing process what it is is a mixture of of red sharp sand and buxton hydrated lime and once you add water to these two components there's an exothermic reaction and which produces the most enormous amount of heat as well. A lot of attention was play, play, um, played on what kind of sand to use as well to get the right color, to get the color of the mortar that you've just seen. You wouldn't think red sand would do it, but there was estuary sand, there was a choice of sands. I think there was a sand from Devon that was tried, but this is the one that, was, that worked the best. So that is, that is after, the exo, after it's cooled, and you can see the beginnings of here. They started cooking, baking potatoes in their jackets and eggs in 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 the heat of of the making of the the mortar. So, an oven was produced. And then, 
the shells again for the aggregate a lot of things were, were put back into the cottage which is something that is meaningful to me and I love the fact that the eggs that we ate we all ate the hard-boiled eggs uh, the shells went back into the mortar this happened when there was a scorching uh, again making mortar you have to have a, a lot of soundings for making mortar and to, to get the process right and on one of these occasions there there was scorching on on the on the mixing station and Connor decided it was a, an apparition and the apparition was Phil Spector and so he the ghost the cottage now has the ghost of Phil Spector now this is rather astonishing and I absolutely love this this picture because not content just with with our baked potatoes and and hard-boiled eggs we also had a feast on, on one occasion and parceled fish. Connor called it Phil Spector's hotline pop-up kitchen. That's when that was born. So here, here are the chimney pots reinstated, as I said. They were made, I, I came across Mike Pinner of West Me and Pottery who who still makes hand hand thrown chimney pots? There's one other in Highgate actually. I discovered afterwards on on a on a house, a Georgian house on on Hornsey Lane. And here in this picture, I'll go into the next one. You'll see that I asked him. So we commissioned the pot, which is a 32 inch pot that that we needed, and I wanted to create new stamps and roulettes for this pot to to commemorate what we were adding to the house and doing doing for the house and Triscoll conservation the Triscoll is this triple spiral and it's formed uh, from from a single long thread or long wire as, as it happens in in this case and it represents continuity and it's also an ancient Celtic symbol and Mike Pinner made made this stamp for Connor and for our pot. So here it is with the newly created stamp. So the oak leaf represents Paul Slack. I chose that for Paul because he's Nottingham born. The five petaled flower is a, a forget me not and it, the five petaled flower was on the, the pot that we couldn't reinstate. And below that is, is a line. This is to represent uh, me and uh, my husband. It's a line from Rilke's first elegy, and, and it says, the line is, oh, and there's night, there's night when wind full of cosmic space feeds on our faces. So this is, this, I hope I'm remembering correctly, I think I am. This, this was called, when we went to collect our pot, this was called the Kensington palette. And Mick Pinner makes pots for, He's made pots for Windsor Castle, for Kensington Palace, and also for local Hampshire cottages. So here is the long tom, uh, which you can see best here. There's a long tom pot, the three pots that went back up. So as I said, Paul began life as his working life as an actor, uh, and like most actors, if you're going to be out of work, you need another profession and that's when he became turned in, into his love of of bricks and building and he's a, a tremendous performer we had such such fun I th there was so much laughter during this whole process once once the fear had abated and the horrors of the situation had gone and I and I felt safe and in safe hands and as I said the Highgate Bowl is a it's a natural auditorium and it's Paul would recite from D.H. Lawrence. He'd put on a, a one-man D.H. Lawrence show in, in the theatre. He'd recite from Monty Python, John Cooper Clarke. But he was he was often larking, both obviously very serious about what he was doing in, in terms of building, but he was a great larker about lovely texture there. This, this I put in because it, it was actually made from a, a seam of 
very apparently very unusual pure blue clay that was found in the Highgate Bowl, made by a potter called Joseph Ludkin. He calls it the wild clay jar. And it was apparently the clay is blue before when it's unoxidized, before it get, comes into contact with, with oxygen. But also the the it was discovered that it's one of the things what the Victorians threw away. There was a hoard of cutlery and bent cutlery, bent spoons. And so you can see he's amalgamated the, the spoon and and the local clay. All. And now, so a final final two slides. This is this is a thing of beauty to me. I am I am so proud of this work. I'm so proud of what the guys did, and also the feeling that that they, they went absolutely over and beyond. We could have just done the repair of the bulge. But the whole of the gable, the whole wall was attended to. So the whole thing is magnificent. So this is in relation to the backs, the backlands and the, the backs of, of the high street. Down below, you'll see the random brick bond. And up above, what was what was rebuilt above is an English bond. And last slide. This is this is the cottage in relation to the Highgate Bowl and and the natural world, nature. So happy to take any questions. All right, thank you so much for that, Jane. That was magnificent. Um, so yes, we're happy to take any questions. You can either drop something in the Q and A function, which you'll find if you click uh, at the bottom of your screen, uh, or indeed if you raise your hand. I will allow you to speak. We have a hand raised, Tim Sage. So if I allow Tim to say something, uh, Tim, do you have a question? Sorry, Tim, could you repeat that for us? I can't quite hear you, Tim. Do you want to perhaps try dropping your question into the Q&A and I can read that out to Jane? Uh, let's see, we've got something in the Q&A here. Gabriel asks, what was the mortar mix? It was a red sharp sand and hydrated lime. And it was for, the hydrated lime was from Buxton. I don't know why that, that was chosen, but clearly it's produced in, in Buxton, in the Peak District. Yes. Uh, any other questions for Jane after her talk? Um, all right. Um, well, Jane, thank you so much uh, for what it was a magnificent Skillshare for us. Um, this will be recorded. So those of you who have booked, and I know one or two of you joined us a bit later, I will be able to access a recording uh, from the SPAD website. Oh, hang on, more Q&As are coming in. Ah, Tim Sage says, the view shows another chimney. Are there any weaknesses to this stack? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, uh, we were able to, to get to the stack and look at it at, at the time when, because of the way the, the scaffolding was arranged on the top. So, so there was nothing alarming at the time. So that was in 2017 when this took place. Mm. But it's certainly, it's certainly straight. It doesn't have a, a lean on it. And Gabriel asks, in relation to the earlier question about the mortar mix, do you know the exact quantities of each? No. No, I'm afraid I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? No? Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and Jane, thank you so much for a magnificent talk. Oh, someone just posted something in our chat. How long did the repairs take? It was, it was nine weeks. So started in February and uh, nine weeks, and we were absolutely blessed with, with good weather, fortunately. I think there were only one or two days when, when it rained. So, and, and that was on the day when the SPAB, the, that, that year's SPAB scholars came on a site <laughs> visit as well. But I, I should say that actually Connor, Connor Meehan was a SPAB scholar as well and started out as a structural engineer and now has, has his own conservation building company but also you could saw from the slides that Connor likes to get 
really hands on and, and involved in, in the actual building side as well. And I believe he's at the working yeah. party, the SPAB working party this week. Yes, yes, it's starting up today, in fact. I'll be going down yeah. there myself this weekend. Um, any other questions? We have a comment from Gabriel saying, thank you, fascinating, lovely work. Ah, oh, good, thank you. Um, so perhaps on that note, we'll draw the session to a close. Jane, thank you so much for spending your time to give such a magnificent talk for us. Um, and we'll look forward to hearing more rather soon um, and hope to see all of you at our next Skillshare in about one month's time. So thanks so very much for joining us. Marvellous. Bye then. Bye, Michael. Bye, everybody.